Hello and welcome back to another Composing with Open Music tutorial. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, some interesting things to be done with rhythm uh, working in open music. Um, if you saw the previous video, we um, ended that one with just a little short exploration of some uh, rhythmic material. And so we're going to kind of pick up where we left off by taking a look um, at using voice objects and rhythm trees. So if you remember in the last video, um, we spent just a little bit of time looking at ways of structuring um, lists and specifically looking at lists of uh, rhythmic patterns. And the, the cool thing about working with rhythms in open music is that they're, they're based on proportion. Um, and open music has this really useful uh, make tree object that will take um, any sort of proportion that you give it um, and it'll assign a, a, a time signature by default but that can also be edited um, and by connecting it to the third or I'm sorry the second inlet on a voice object you can very quickly get a rhythm as a result and again uh, open music is really flexible so you can um, instead of just having one time signature, you can make a list of time signatures that you'd like to use. Um, you know, something like this maybe. Uh, so now I have a, a two layer list where the first list includes three sublist objects, and each of those sublist um, items itself has two. Uh, two lists or two items, uh, two numbers that represent the time signature. So when we evaluate, we see, yeah, we get uh, an interesting result there. Now you'll notice, um, unlike the uh, the rhythm that we were working with in the previous video, this one's got a tuplet. So let me just quick kind of explain how that works. What I've done to make this rhythm um, is uh, in this list up here. I've just represented um, quarter notes with ones, half notes with a half. So you can see I've got a quarter, quarter, half, half, quarter, and then a third, third, third uh, to represent that triplet, and then two half or two uh, halves again representing the half of the beat, and then uh, ones for the quarter. Um, and then what I needed to do to make sure um, to make sure that the one actually represented a quarter note, I had to divide this whole proportion um, by four. So for example, if I didn't do that, if I divide it by one, you'll see that the voice object interprets a one as a whole note, which actually makes, you know, makes sense. It's the, the, the whole um, of our four, four time signature. Um, so uh, in order to make it work at a beat level where I'm talking about um, quarter notes uh, you know half as the beat and half notes I'm sorry eighth notes is the half of the beat uh, triplet as a third of the beat I needed to divide by four and then use this make tree object so here we go here you can see um, that we've got that rhythm that we started with now, if you remember in the last video I also um, there is a, a brief point where I was trying to remember um, a, a little trick that you can do with proportions in open music. And I, I looked back at the documentation and remembered how this works. So you can select this make tree object and hit V to evaluate. And you'll notice that open music produces um, this really strange list here um, in the listener. So I'm going to select that and copy double click and paste to make that a, a new list object. So we'll keep that over there and um, let's go take a quick look at the documentation and see what this all means. So if you um, if you go to the documentation under score objects you'll find this section here notation in practice and it has a really good explanation of how um, you know how these voice uh, object rhythms are constructed. And what make tree is doing, make tree is a is a function that simplifies this process. 
So um, it, it will interpret your, um, your instructions for proportions and for meters to produce this type of list, like what we just saw over here. So the, the make tree object is translating from proportions and, and meter uh, you know, time signature changes to these types of list objects. So um, there's a really great explanation of how this works. So for example, you'll notice that if you take one of these numbers and proceed it with a minus, it turns it into a rest of that same duration. So we can um, substitute this rhythm here and maybe let's change uh, let's change the first quarter note to a rest. So we change that and all of a sudden we've got a nice little rest there. Um, again, we could do this with the, um, the triplet in the second measure. So here what I'm doing, um, and again this is maybe a little hard to see, uh, but you can see here um, there's a little break between these two parentheses where the first measure ends and the second measure begins in the notation. And so it gives the, the time signature for that measure. And then this starts um, beat one, and you'll see that that beat is subdivided into, into three, a one and a one and a one. So I can, if I wanted to, I could change that subdivision uh, to something like this, and we'll see it just becomes an eighth and two sixteenths. I could change the subdivision into uh, a quintuplet, um, 3 plus 1 plus 1, there we go. Um, or I could do something like this, change it into a quintuplet and then a rest on the fourth beat. And again this is a little small but let's zoom in here and see. So we've got th the three fifths of the beat, a rest on the fourth fifth, and then another attack on the fifth fifth of the beat. So again, you know, pretty sophisticated um, uh, rhythmic stuff, and that's that's not even all of it yet. So let's go back over, um, and this is uh, what we were just talking about. Um, values within a group are beamed automatically, and you can uh, achieve various tuplets that way. If you'd like to force open music to tie to the previous note, um, you can add uh, a point zero. So let's uh, just quick demonstrate that with the last two in this measure. So if we go over here, go to the end of this list, and make this 1.0, and then evaluate. Sure enough, we've got a tie now between those two quarters, which is kind of cool. Um, let's see what else that they mention. Yeah, so here you, you can, um, there are various ways that you can actually force um, force open music to ad adopt certain notation practices. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can certainly look at that. Um, but maybe one last thing uh, I'll mention with this is you, you really can get quite sophisticated. So again, uh, this was the portion of the second beat where we turned this into a quintuplet. If I wanted to, I could do yet another level of a tuplet. Um, so taking the first three, um, three fifths of that quintuplet, and um, and then making that into maybe a triplet. So let's see the result. Yeah, there we go. We get a nested. Oh, maybe that's not exactly what I want. Let's see. See if we can do a top, yeah. Yeah, so here you can actually really explicitly see, um, turns the whole beat into a septuplet. Um, and then, oh boy, so let's see. Uh, then we have a six to five. How does that work? Okay, so you know, this, this is something that I'd have to sit down and, and calculate out and really figure out what's going on here. But suffice it to say, um, you know, some of the really advanced techniques that composers like um, Fernie Ho, Michael Finnessy, um, Aaron Cassidy would be using with um, very complicated, you know, nested tuplets, um, uh, or, you know, things like metric modulations, all sorts of cross rhythms and polyrhythms. Um, 
these, these sorts of materials can be created very naturally and efficiently um, using open music. Um, so maybe as a demonstration of some of the more sophisticated stuff you can do specifically with rhythm, um, I'll, I'll maybe just demonstrate a, a couple of projects um, that I've worked on recently. So um, one project was I, I needed a very efficient um, efficient way of generating a, a large number of randomized rhythm examples um, based on very specific sorts of rhythmic constraints. So I, I produced this, um, this patch, it's a little messy, um, and, and what this does is it uses something called a Markov uh, matrix which is a way of assigning a probability. Um, so like for example, a, a way of explaining it would be um, it, it uses various rhythmic units and you can see them listed here. So this would be 2 sixteenths, an eighth rest in 2 sixteenths, a dotted eighth, a sixteenth, and two eighths. And what the Markov matrix does is it says if I'm on this rhythmic pattern how probable is it that I go to this pattern, or this pattern, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one? And it, it'll, it'll calculate that um, for you and generate a, a randomized um, rhythm pattern, which is really just tremendously useful. Um, and you can even do it, um, so for example, this one is set up to do um, multiple, um, multiple polyphonic voices with, with rhythms that are generated from the same rhythmic material. Um, so you can have it do like a duet. Uh, oops. Repeat once. And yeah, you can have it make a, a duet of, of randomized rhythm patterns that you could give to uh, you know, a music student. Um, so you know, there are, there's some really wonderful things that you can do, um, do with the software. So for example, one, one thing when I was working on this project was I wanted to uh, to force the software to include some cadences um, so that there is a sense of, of having a, a, a rhythmic um, point of arrival. So here on the 17th measure we've got a cadence um, and then I think in the 9th measure there should be one. Yeah, we've got a type of cadence here um, <laughs> incidentally tied over the bar line. Um, but again, you, you know, you can do some really powerful stuff. You can cha uh, change, um, change the durations. So now everything will be doubled in, in uh, note duration. Um, I can also force it to, to use some specific patterns. Um, uh, so if, you know, if, I, if I wanted to have, um, let's see if this works the way I thought it did. Maybe not. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, that, that was a meter. So what I was able to do was, um, was force it to, for example, include um, various types of tuplet figures um, at different points in the example for students to practice tuplets. Um, uh, I was able to to get it to produce a mix meter example. Um, so let's see if it'll do a mixed. Yeah. So here it will just produce some random mix meter uh, examples, and I can I can specify what sorts of meters it should use. Um, it'll automatically identify the meter and supply a, a, a cadence that actually makes sense in that meter. Um, and then uh, once I had all these, I was able to just save, uh, save these examples as MIDI files, uh, format them in my notation software, and uh, it, was, it was a huge time saver and a, a really useful, um, uh, useful project. Another one that's, uh, that's been a more recent project has been uh, 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 some work for a class that I'm currently enrolled in, which encourages um, interdisciplinary research between uh, composition students like myself and biology majors. Um, 
So let me pull up one of those. Let's see. So, um, so the biology students provided us with um, with variants, uh, various sequences of, of data that they um, that they end up using in their research. And so, let me see if I can pull up an example of what that data would be like. Yeah, here's a good one. So the data is various values between like negative five and zero. Um, and so in this patch, what I asked Open Music to do was um, turn these into uh, you know, scale steps along a, a diatonic scale, um, just a C diatonic scale. And then what I had Open Music do was analyze the, the distances um, between successive notes in terms of an interval class. So for example, um, the interval class here to here would be two um, because we're stepping from a D up to E um, and that's separated by two semitones. The interval class from this G to D uh, would be five, uh, stepping down five semitones. So uh, Open Music will go through, um, let me lock this. It'll go through and it will come up with a list of all those interval classes for me, which is super, uh, super convenient. And then what I did was I, I had it turn those interval classes into a list of proportions of 16th notes. Um, so, so then what I could do is actually um, use the, the distances in terms of pitch between successive notes as a source of rhythmic material in this voice object. Um, so what that does is it correlates a larger distance between two successive notes with a longer, um, longer note value. Um, and so it was just a really fast way of representing the same data in terms of both pitch um, and rhythm very quickly. Um, I'm not sure if we'll actually use it for our final results for this project. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about working with open music is you can design a patch to accomplish this once, um, and then you can apply it again and again and again to a wide variety of data. So eventually with this patch, I'm able to export all of the, the information about the sequence and about the interval class, um, and about um, even some statistics about uh, how many um, uh, how many instances of each interval class there are? So I was able to have Open Music count and tell me how many tritones, or how many minor seconds, or how many repeated notes. Um, so again, you know, it's it's very powerful software. This is just one example of of the sort of thing that you can do. Um, and in this case, uh, make make tree. And these uh, proportion lists were really at the heart of what I wanted to uh, be able to accomplish in terms of rhythm with this project. So again, I hope this has been uh, helpful for you. And let me know if you have any questions. Um, be happy to try and, and offer some resources um, if, if that's something that would be helpful. Um, and let me know as well if you have uh, suggestions or requests for future topics. Thanks again for joining me and I hope to see you in the next video.